you know how sometimes you get information from like multiple sources from different places that you respect that you know are relatively legitimate or completely legitimate and they're saying like completely different things about the same subject like in my case I'm talking about like I was trying to get information on anamorphic shooting and so I checked out a video that Potato Jet made and then I checked out Anamorphic on a Budget and I checked out Studio Binder. Now all three of these channels are like my favorite channels. Like I love all of them, you know? And I think Potato Jet probably makes the best videos of like an independent filmmaker. Studio Binder is a very professional channel. I'm sure they have a whole crew, they got a whole company. You know, an Anamorphic on a Budget, that kid is like dedicated to Anamorphic. Smartest guy, I've gotten so many resources from him over the years of helping me to figure out anamorphic and my aspect ratios and trying to figure out all the math and suddenly they're given different information and actually anamorphic on the budget the, that guy he called out potato jet for a video that he had put out and studio binder was even different than the two of those and so i'm saying all this to say i think they all held a lot of value you know like, I could extract stuff from each of those videos that was really, really valuable for me and really helped me a lot. But also, there might have been misinformation in those videos. And, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because, to me, you got to get what you can get out of YouTube, and then you got to go out and you actually have to shoot. And you actually got to, you know, do the work, like apply it, and then you're going to learn, you know. But, I mean, it's just an example of how YouTube can really fuck with your head. You know what I mean? Like on so many, so many levels. You know, in the example that I'm giving here, but also in the example of putting out a video, you get like 3,000 views, and then the next video you put out, and you think you're following kind of the same formula, and you get 58 videos, I mean 58 views. Like it's just, it's a weird thing. You know what I mean? And I think people think they have to put out a video every week, and it, you know, it's like, some people say do that and other people say nobody cares and other people say put out a video every day and I'm just saying I'm sure in all kinds of other different spaces when you're talking about getting information for pretty much anything you know don't forget that anybody can be on YouTube and anybody can say anything and nobody is necessarily completely qualified and you know even even in spaces outside of YouTube where people like go to school and train and get prepared for a certain space. It doesn't mean that they're not making mistakes. It doesn't mean that they're not wrong. It doesn't mean that they're not behind in the acceleration of the technology or of the knowledge or whatever. Like nobody is always right, you know? But there are people who you trust and who resonate with you and that's who you should follow. But I really think the only person you should really follow is you. And that's the thing that I'm talking about today. I'm talking about how, you know, watching YouTube can make your head explode sometimes, you know, can drive you crazy, can, can make you think that you're losing your mind because the way you feel on Tuesday might have nothing to do with the way you feel on Wednesday. And then Thursday, you feel a completely different kind of way. And it's just kind of crazy. You know what I mean? It's nuts. And so this is a video about how I think my brain looks when I watch YouTube too much and I don't get out there and just do the work. Because for me, at the end of the day, everything that I've learned has been applied knowledge from actually making films. Now, in my case, I came to YouTube for the filmmaking space because during the pandemic, my theater work got shut down. And I was trying to find a different way to express myself creatively. And so I was kind of going by YouTube University. And sorry, I'm looking around because there's I'm kind of on an open road and there might be traffic coming both ways or a train. As you see, the train tracks right behind me. And this is actually the pedestrian bridge up here in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is kind of a cool bridge. So anyway, I've learned everything from application, you know, going out there and doing it. Because during the pandemic, I came to the filmmaking space because I decided to make a movie based on my theatrical script. And in the spirit of never letting anything stop me from making art, from telling my stories, from sharing my heart and my soul, I had to come here and learn. But I have to admit, at times it was very confusing. And I learned that at the end of the day, like I said, 
you have to depend upon yourself. You have to acquire enough, you know, as much knowledge as you possibly can. And then you have to apply it. You got to go out there and just trial and error and just give it a shot. You know, look at it and just keep working at it until everything looks the way you want it to look, sounds the way you want it to sound, and most importantly, feels the way you want it to feel. And so, yeah, this video is, to kind of, is like a note to myself. You know, I'm actually speaking to myself in most of this video. So don't get it twisted. I'm not talking to you. I'm not judging you. I'm kind of letting you inside of my own brain and talking to myself because I realize that sometimes, like I said, I'll say something on Tuesday and then Thursday I feel completely differently. But I also notice, and this is the most important part, that on Tuesday, the stuff that I said first, I was so sure of it that I might have sounded like a complete asshole speaking if I decided to make a video or something like that. And then two days later, I realized I was wrong. And I'm like, oh, you arrogant fuck. Like, what are you doing? And so hopefully I learned those lessons to never take anything for granted, to always understand that I might not be right. Or if I'm absolutely right, make sure it's like science. You know what I mean? Like, make sure it's something that I've tried over and over and over again, so that if I give absolute information that I know that it's true and that it works. But at the end of the day, and I've said that now three times, it might not work for everybody because your process might not be like my process. And so, yeah, here's a look inside of my own brain from watching too many YouTube videos. All right. If you're an independent artist, this video is kind of pointed at you and there's just a lot of good stuff in here and some of it is tough love and some of it is just pure love, you know, because, you know, sometimes we can get all up inside of our own heads, you know, and kind of lose focus on where we're headed and what we want and what our goals are and what our destination is and we just start to get caught up with what other people are doing or what we're not accomplishing or what obstacles are standing in front of us or whatever. And so I just want to remind you as an independent artist that we're here to support one another, to lift one another, to encourage one another. We're here to inspire one another. We are here to love one another. I'm going to say that again. We are here to love one another. And so don't forget that. And while you're watching this video and I put it together in kind of a creative way and I'm trying to do my own thing, just know that that's my intention. My intention is to lift, to bring us together, to try to get us all to do better work, to be better people, to make better contributions to the world and to one another, to just, you know, make everything more livable and more human for all of us. So keep that in mind when you watch this video. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So let me ask you a question. What the fuck is wrong with technology? Like, why can't you accept that things change and perhaps get better? And what's wrong with technology making things easier for people? 
I'm thinking a lot about Ibis um, because I don't know I heard I don't even know if this is right but I heard that the ZBE 10 Mark II, the new one, you know, the one that everybody's talking about, doesn't have improved IBIS. Or, you know, why add the IBIS when you could use Catalyst Browse? Um, talking about stabilization, for those who don't know. What's wrong with, you know, more stops of, of IBIS? Like, that could be really helpful, you know? Think about handheld shooting. I mean, obviously that's helpful. You want that camera shake? Like, come on, why do you need to be the, the fucking Zen master of cameras? What's wrong with IBIS? There's nothing wrong with it. 12 stops, 15 stops, the more the merrier, obviously. That's ridiculous. And I've been thinking about it, you know, and it's like, what is the big deal about IBIS and stabilization? Um, I guess unless you're a vlogger, you know, and you're walking around carrying the camera around, but even then, if you could use Catalyst Browse, or if you know how to use a gimbal, what's the big deal? Is it worthy of a hundred reviews? Is it worthy of people spending all that time? Why, and who are you to judge anyway? Like who are you to tell people what's better, what's not better, what they should be doing, how they should be approaching their work? You know, approach the work how you want to approach your work and that's it, then just shut the fuck up. Um, I guess it is worth it to them because it's an embargo and they're somehow associated with Sony. And so I get that. It's business, you know, and you're trying to, you know, keep this YouTube thing going and, um, you know, be successful at it and have a relationship with Sony. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it just makes me think about stabilization in a camera and what that means, you know. What exactly does it mean that your camera can get you stable footage? And does that even matter in the grand scheme of things, you know? And does that help you or does it hurt you? But anyway, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm doing this video about stabilization and I'm thinking this is a really important video because I really believe what I'm saying. Like I don't really care about the stabilization in the camera, but yet when I finished it and I listened back to it, I thought, man, you sound so pretentious, like so arrogant, like, come on. IBIS really is helpful. There's nothing wrong with IBIS. Um, because I don't think you have any real level of stabilization. I don't think you have enough stops of stabilization unless you buy a camera, whether it be the ZV-E10 Mark II or the Mark I, if you want to go 8-bit, you know, whether you have the uh, GH7, Panasonic, Lumix, you know, if you have the G9 Mark II, if you have the S52X, if you have a Nikon Z6 III, if you have a Canon R5C or an R8 or whatever, no matter what you have, I think that you only have really good stabilization, enough stops of stabilization, if you buy a camera and you commit to it. Who? Who made you the gatekeeper of how to use cameras? And why do you think it would be better to own just one camera? What's wrong with owning a bunch of different cameras? You know, you found one of your cameras for 475 bucks. What's the big deal? Some people are spending like, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 6,000 dollars on one camera. What's wrong with somebody who has like four cameras that all cost like four or five, 600 bucks? What's wrong with somebody who has the money and wants to spend the money on a bunch of different expensive cameras. Like, why do you even care? What does it have to do with your life? How does it even affect you? What's the big deal? Let people live, you know? <laughs> Jeez, what difference does it make? I don't, I don't understand, you know? And you really get to know the intricacies of it, how it works, the quirks, you know? The advantages and the disadvantages, the strong points and the weak points and you make all of it work to your advantage. You make all of it work in the, in the helping of your storytelling because that's all that matters. And so when you think about it, the very top of the line cinema cameras, like we're making videos, right? So if you're talking about cinema cameras in Hollywood, the top documentaries, the top narrative films, all the best cinema cameras, 
They don't have any stabilization. They have no IBIS. The filmmaker has to figure it out. He has to solve problems. He has to make it work. It doesn't have stabilization. It doesn't have autofocus for that matter. What's the big deal? Why does somebody have to get used to a camera? Like, how about this? When somebody learns all the settings in a camera, when they understand their ISO settings and their white balance settings, and when they start to really understand composition and, you know, things of that nature, like the things that really matter, why do they have to like only be able to do that with one camera? Actually, it's the opposite. You know, because if you really, really get a grasp on all that stuff, you should be able to use pretty much any camera. So what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't understand. It feels like you're just saying shit to say it sometimes. Like, oh, I know what you're doing. You're just trying to figure out what's my next YouTube video, right? That's what you complain other people do, but you're doing the same thing. And so think about that. You know, what exactly is stabilization, you know? Stabilization is really you committing to this instrument and then practicing and learning how to use it and having something that gives you a sense of stability knowing that you have something that you know how it works inside out you know the menu system you know all the buttons you know all the lenses that you like that go along with it that you've chosen you know what it looks like you know you know what the image quality is like which is the most important thing right like you're making movies you're making moving pictures you're making videos you're making cinema at the end of the day what it looks like is what matters and let's face it Every camera made in the last 10 years or so looks great. You know, you can nitpick, you can talk about an optical low pass filter, which I wish I had, but I don't have. But you know, Moiré for me has shown up maybe twice or three times in the two years that I've had the Panasonic S5. And I never saw it in the Sony a6400. So I, you know, I just, at some point, after being completely obsessed with it and almost buying an S1H, because the Panasonic S1H has an optical low pass filter. At some point, I just decided to let it go. I was like, yo, it's got nothing to do with my storytelling. It can't stop me. It's not that important. Because guess what? I reminded myself that I made a full length feature film on my phone and it became an award winning film. And why? Because I was dedicated to it and I knew that's all I had. And at the time, I think it was kind of an advantage that I kind of had no idea what I was doing. But by the time I finished that film, I knew all about what I was doing. You know, that's what matters. Like for example, today everybody's talking about the ZV-E10 Mark II and you're like, oh geez, who can, can I watch it? Can I see another ZV-E10 Mark II video go down my timeline? Yeah, but you know what? They're just trying to look for the next YouTube video. What are you doing? You're talking about it and that's your next YouTube video. So what, what, what's different about you from them? What's the big, and you know what, maybe you could learn something from them. A lot of people make these videos and they include little tips that could work for any video. I mean, for any camera. You got me so upset, I can't even cap capture the words that I'm trying to say. Learn about how to use your ISO and your white balance and learn how to, like I said, go through the menu system and get on your settings correct. You know, use the proper shutter speed, the shutter angle, shoot at 24 frames per second or whatever frames per second makes you feel good the way you want it to look you know use slow motion if you want to or not you know whatever like learn your aesthetic but have one instrument and have it for years so that it's your thing you know this is what you use what difference does it make you're just trying to do the same thing everybody else is doing. You're trying to get people to your channel. You're trying to get people to subscribe. You're trying to get people to hit the like button. Just because you don't say it doesn't mean you're doing anything different. And don't front. Don't act like you're just doing this for fun. I mean, yes, it's good practice. Yes, it's good to have this as a foundation and not depend upon it, but you're doing the same thing, you know? You know, a lot of great baseball players, they, they go crazy when they break a bat because they're so like superstitious. Like, this bat has hit me all these home runs. It's got me all these hits. It's got me to the World Series. Basketball players sometimes wear the same socks. Like, it's all kind of crazy. But in the case of a camera, I don't think it's crazy. I think you choose something and you commit to it. You dedicate yourself to it. And then you work with it every single day. And you don't negotiate with that. You know, you, you make it a part of your practice, your craft. 
It becomes a spiritual practice. It becomes something that you're attached to. And then if anything happens to it, you've learned it so well that suddenly you could use any camera. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it has 12 stops of IBIS or 15 stops or 8 stops or whatever. It doesn't matter if it has zero stops of IBIS because you have now stabilized your filmmaking life and you know how to make it work. You know what works. You know how to do it. Okay. So maybe this is a space for practice, for perfecting your craft, for getting better at storytelling. This realm of storytelling, this visual storytelling, but you know, like you have to niche down, you know, oh my God, there's a ladybug on the camera as I'm talking right now. That's so crazy. Should I get up and move it? I probably should because it's going to crawl into one of those holes. So I'll be back in one sec. Somebody can hand you an Ari Alexa or they can hand you a Sony a6000, a Canon M50. They can hand you a Panasonic S52X or a Sony a7S III. It doesn't matter. It's going to look the same way that it would look no matter what you shot with because you are the talent. You are the artist. You are the one making it work. It doesn't matter what you have. And as a matter of fact, when you commit to a, to a camera and you keep it, you kind of get that out of the equation, the stuff that doesn't matter. Because what does matter is your composition, is the aperture that you choose, the foreground that you create or work with, the background, how you want it to look. That's what matters. It doesn't matter what camera did it. That was weird. There's a lot of ladybugs around here. I think that's a good sign. Anyway. Right now I'm using the Panasonic GH5. This is a micro four thirds camera. I'm shooting at f1.2, which is really not f1.2 if it was a full frame camera, but still, it's kind of blurred in the background. It's micro four thirds. You can make it work no matter what. Doesn't matter. Doesn't make a difference. It's all about you. Why do you have to niche down? You don't have to niche down. You're not niching down. You're doing anything you want to do. You're saying anything you want to say. You're not playing by the rules. You're not doing anything. But suddenly, now we're seeing all these videos about how YouTube is changing. YouTube is dying. My channel is dying. Everything, you know, the algorithm is changing. You need to be more organic. Oh, wow, another ladybug. You need to be more organic. You have to stop doing these perfect videos. People want to see the truth. Well, in that case, you don't have to change anything. You've been doing that all along. So you need to stabilize your filmmaking practice, your filmmaking techniques, your filmmaking journey, how you work, how you like to work. You want to be unique. You want to be only you. You want it to look like, oh my God, that like in my case, when people look at a film, they go, oh, <laughs> Rock definitely shot that. Like that's his style. That's his thing. I know what it looks like immediately. You know, you want to be like the equivalent of Prince or John Coltrane. Like, the minute people see something, they know it's Spike Lee. They know it's the Coen Brothers. They know it's Roger Deakins. Like, they know it's you. I saw a video today where somebody was celebrating a thousand subscribers that took him. Guess how long it took? Guess how long it took to get him a thousand subscribers? And by the way, this video was dope. Like, sound effects, the video, like, everything about it was like the highest level Casey Neistat level of vlogging, okay? Took him nine years to get to a thousand subscribers. Nine years. This guy is niched out. I couldn't believe it. Like seriously, nine years? That's crazy. Because sometimes I see people that it took six months. They're like, well, I did my first video six months ago and now I'm up to 2,300 subscribers. And I'm like, how the fuck did that happen? So there's no rhyme or reason to it. And you have to like, get all the spec stuff out of your head, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that this camera has better autofocus than that camera, that this camera has better dynamic range than that camera, it doesn't matter. You have to learn about lighting, how to create the scene that you want exactly how you want it to look, or to recreate what you're looking at, no matter what camera you have. That's what you want to learn about. You want to dive into DaVinci Resolve or Premiere Pro or whatever you use and really learn how to edit and how to color how to deal with your 10-bit 422 footage that you, you know, so, so, like, so desperately needed. And then you're going to figure out that you could have done that with 8-bit. I saw somebody today make a video that his YouTube channel is dying. This is the same person 
who told me not to worry about how many people are watching your videos, that he looked at it as picturing a whole bunch of people in a room. You know, like if the room is full, if there are nine people or 19 people, or if it's an auditorium and there are 2,300 people, whatever. Don't worry about the amount of people yet. He put out a video where it only had like 45 or 75 views and he's used to, you know, he's got like 11,000 subscribers. I understand, you know, he's trying to earn a living at this and, and it's just, see, that's the thing. YouTube fucks with your head, you know, like for me, I had like three videos in a row that did really well for me, 1500, 1700 views. I never get that. And suddenly three in a row, I got it, you know? And the funny thing was, I was like, nobody's going to watch these videos. I'm cursing, I'm doing whatever I want. I'm, I'm like, just, there's like no rhyme or reason to what I'm doing. And people all of a sudden watched it like they loved it, you know? And then all of a sudden I did a video saying, thank you for 900 subscribers. I got like 400 views. I actually did a video also for Father's Day that got like 130 views. Like, what is the answer? You know, like people don't care about my father. Why should they care about my father? Of course they don't care about my father. He's my father. It's not their father. But still, that's kind of a personal, vulnerable, you know, I mean, I was being very honest. You know, I'm not, I'm not fronting about anything. I'm telling the truth all the time. I'm being completely transparent. I'm being pretty vulnerable a lot of the time. And sometimes I get 1,700 views and sometimes I get 2,800 views and sometimes I get 93 views. You know, there's no rhyme or reason. I have 930 something subscribers. When I get to 1,000, do I expect suddenly I'm gonna be earning my living doing this? No, I don't. I have no idea what's gonna happen. You know, you only want full frame? Most of the greatest films ever made were shot Super 35, which is kind of APS-C. Plenty of amazing projects have been done on micro four-thirds cameras. So, IBIS, stabilization, everybody's talking about it. It's trending. That's what it's about today. That's what it's about all the time, actually. Specs, you know? How's the autofocus? Oh my God, we can't use this camera because the autofocus sucks. Guess what? For me personally, and this is just me, I'm not saying this is right for everybody, but I don't even use autofocus. I don't even think about it because none of my lenses even have autofocus except for one, which as it turns out, I almost never use it. It's my only zoom lens. I have a Sigma, Sigma 28 to 70 f 2.8 and I almost never use it. Not because it has autofocus, but because I'd rather work with primes. Like why you always got to pick the harder way to do things, you know? Why are you that guy? You know, like what's wrong with autofocus? What's the problem with autofocus? Like, just because it makes it easier, you don't like it? Maybe some people are just doing YouTube videos. Maybe some people are working with a gimbal all the time and they're just cutting the best of the shot that they do. Like, maybe they're shooting, I don't know, 20 minutes at a time and they just want to extract like three minutes from that 20 minutes. What's, and maybe they don't care what 20, you know, what three minutes they're choosing. Like, what's the big deal, you know? Why are you the gatekeeper of focus? And I just feel more comfortable that way. And I shoot with 28 millimeters or 50 millimeters 99% of the time with my Panasonic S5, which happens to be a full frame camera. On this GH5, right now I'm shooting with a TT Artisan 17 millimeter f1.4. And I also have a Mikey 35 millimeter f1.4. So the equivalent, 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter. Pretty close. But I've learned over the last couple of years because I shoot with it every single day I know what the world looks like at 28 millimeters. And when I want to do something a little bit more intimate, close up, and I want it to look different, like more compressed, I want to add a little bit of, you know, like effect to it, I use a 50 millimeter because it, it affects my face. It affects the way the subject looks a lot differently than a 17 millimeter, which is 35 equivalent. I'm sorry, now I'm talking about my full frame, so it looks a lot different than my 28 millimeter. What I like about the 28 millimeter is that it doesn't distort my face when I get close. And it's the same thing with the 17 millimeter. It's really not that bad. Right now I'm arm's length, so I'm only about two and a half or three feet from the, from the front of this lens. And I'm not really distorted. And actually the advantage of having a micro four thirds camera right now is that I can shoot at f1.4 because it's not really f1.4. It's more the equivalent of like an f2.5 or 2.8 and so I don't have to like stay totally still. I can move a little bit, but I digress. There's nothing wrong with autofocus. There's nothing wrong with using your camera in auto mode. 
I just don't do that. And I prefer manual lenses and I prefer shooting anamorphic or with vintage lenses. And that, but that's me. That's not you. You don't have to be like me. I don't have to be like you. We don't have to be like each other. That's what makes the world go around. You know, I mean, it just, I don't know. I felt like I was being what I hate in other people, being pejorative, being holier than thou, looking down upon people for what they were doing. And who the fuck am I to do that? Like, I shouldn't do that, you know? You need IBIS, get the GH7, you know? Or be mad about the ZVE-10 Mark II because the GH7 has the best IBIS apparently in the world. I've never touched it. The ZVE-10 Mark II has no IBIS, so use Catalyst Browse. Good luck with that. And as far as I'm concerned, the Panasonic S5 has great IBIS because when I walk around just handheld, it works great, you know? So it doesn't really bother me. And the GH5, the same thing. It works great. So I don't really have a problem with that. But what I'm talking about is I think that IBIS stabilization, how stable is the footage because of the camera, because of the IBIS, because of the electronic stabilization, the, you know, just the normal stabilization, the catalyst browse, whatever. You know, Dimitri Resolve stabilization. It's really about learning your craft, mastering your craft, shooting as best you can, and then using whatever tools you need to make it work, you know? But you don't have to pick a camera because it's got the best IBIS. I know that, you know, I shouldn't be going around telling people what to do and how to approach their page and how to be a filmmaker. I mean, who, who am I to tell somebody how to be a filmmaker? I've been a filmmaker for like four years. You know, there are people who've been doing this for 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 50 years. I'm telling you how to be a filmmaker? I'm telling you that you don't need IBIS? That's crazy talk. There are people who have Almost everybody watching this probably has more subscribers than me. Probably gets more likes, you know, probably has a better channel than I have. And I'm telling you how to approach this. That is cr straight up crazy talk. I can't believe I did that. So I apologize for that. But on the other hand, it is how I feel, you know, like who cares? You know, like stabilization to me is this is just me. This is just me. Don't get mad at me. But stabilization to me is getting a camera and sticking with it and creating this really solid foundation of your work, like your workflow, like you know the camera you're using, you know the settings, you know the buttons, you know your lenses, you know how everything works, you know how different, you know, the same aperture in different lenses works, you know how something works in APS-C mode versus full frame mode, you know how your uh, micro four thirds camera works, like to me, that is the best IBIS, that's the best stabilization and obviously, I'm saying IBIS as a metaphor for stabilizing your workflow, you know, stabilizing how you go about telling your stories, how you do what you do. That's the best way to do it for me. Because it's really not going to make a difference if you don't master composition, if you don't see every inch of the frame, if you don't consider every single spot on that frame, nothing else is going to help you. If you don't consider where you want to focus in that frame, Autofocus is not going to help you because there's always a chance that autofocus is going to make a decision without you. And so for YouTube videos, fine, you know. If you need autofocus that's totally consistent all the time, go buy a Sony camera, whatever. I'm not, I'm not bashing that. I'm not, no shade at all. But I'm just saying, for me, I never think about it. I've made two feature films, manual focus all the way. I like to be a part of the process like that, you know. And I like the fact that now I've used this Panasonic S5 so much for the last couple of years that I know it like the back of my hand. Like I know where everything is. If I want to make any adjustments, I can make them quickly. I know what it's going to look like. I know what the colors look like. I know what the dynamic range is like. I know what I can expect in any kind of scene. And I kind of feel the same way about the GH5, even though I haven't used it as much, so I don't feel like I've mastered it. Like I'm not quite sure the way it's going to look. It deals with skin tones a little bit differently. It is a little bit different using Micro Four Thirds, and so I'm not as confident using this camera. And I'm trying to use it more often just so I get used to it, so I have as much of a command of it as I do with the S5. But see, that is stabilization. And I do honestly think people spend too much time thinking about gear. And I do think people spend too much time thinking about specs. And I do happen to think that none of that matters all that much. I think that you can learn all that shit in like six months, you know, like if you're diligent and you practice all the time and if you get out there and you shoot every day, I think you could learn how to set your white balance and use your ISO settings and learn about composition, all that kind of stuff in six months. But then 
it's like a lifetime of refining that, you know? Then it's getting your own aesthetic, it's getting your own style. You know, you become, you become that kind of artist that creates work that is completely original and unique to you, not to anybody else, but that ain't about gear. I'm sorry, gear does matter. There goes a the train. Gear does matter, but it doesn't matter like that. You know what I mean? If that makes any sense to you, like that. What does like that even mean? I'm stabilizing my process. I'm giving myself a really solid foundation. You know, I'm creating a situation for myself where I'm really centered and balanced and nothing can get me off my, off my thing. Like I know what I'm doing and I know what to expect. And I'm more adept at solving problems and figuring things out if I reach any kind of obstacles because I know my instrument because it's hardly even an instrument anymore. It's kind of like my camera and my eyes and my ears and my brain and my heart. They're all kind of the same thing now. And if you just keep buying cameras because they have better specs, or if you keep just buying cameras because of the specs, at the end of the day, what are you doing? I think that, <sighs> wow, I've come full circle. Um, yeah, you should understand how you want to work. <laughs> but maybe you have no idea how you want to work it. Maybe you should get like the cheapest good camera that you can find. Get like a Canon M50 or a Sony A6000 or something like that. You know, get something that's going to cost you two or three hundred bucks. Get a, a camera that doesn't even have interchangeable lenses. Something that you don't necessarily want to grow with because you're not going to grow with this camera. You're going to learn. You're going to learn about ISO and white balance and all the things I talked about. You're going to learn about focal length. You're going to learn about aperture. You're going to learn about all these things, lighting, sound. Get your skills together and then choose a camera that you can grow with. You know, why? You know, I bet you that if you buy these cameras and you finally get something that you love, that you're happy with, and you don't have stories to tell and you don't commit to like creating something to get it out there and share it with people, you're going to get bored of that and you're going to go try to buy another one at some point or you're not going to be involved with cameras at all after a while. Because at the end of the day, they are for something. You know, they're not for themselves. They're not just to have. They're not a lamp or they're not a beautiful, you know, piece of furniture that you just bought because it's classic and it's an antique. And that's not what they're, they're actual tools, they're instruments. It's like owning a screwdriver but never using it. Like, it might look like the most beautiful screwdriver ever made, but it doesn't mean anything and it serves no purpose. Then, okay, drive yourself crazy, look at all the videos, learn about all the specs, you know, decide between, you know, full frame APS-C or Micro Four Thirds or whatever else there is, film or digital, you know. And then, you know, watch all the videos that you can, watch all these celebrity YouTubers, all the people who just made this video about, you know, we're making a movie and, you know, I'm being an actor for the first time in my life and now I'm a cinematographer and, you know, it's obvious that somebody got them all together and paid them to all be in the same place at the same time and make this video that seemed like they were on a Hollywood set behind the scenes and that's cool but of no interest to somebody like me I don't care you know and to me I'm not even gonna judge it I'm not gonna say anything about it so get something and don't worry about the IBIS don't worry about the stabilization don't worry about the autofocus don't worry about any of it think more about what you are doing what you want to do what you need to do and what you feel will help you to accomplish that. And then it should be pretty easy to pick a camera because pretty much every camera is going to have almost everything that you need today. Like if you really, really, really are focused on making the most beautiful image that you can, then try to get a 10 bit 422, you know, a camera that can shoot 10 bit. But don't think that 8 bit is not going to be enough because you'd be surprised. But I'm just saying, watch those videos because they're all smart, they're all talented, they know a lot. Learn all the basics and then get a camera, choose the GH7 or the S52X or the Sony A7S3 or whatever. Choose the camera of your choice. Maybe choose the ecosystem that resonates with you. Like, you know, part of the reason I chose Panasonic over Sony, because I started with a Sony. I actually started with a Sony because I was like, it seems to me like most of the videos I'm watching are Sony users, so that's what I'm going to go with. Because I didn't know anything about the algorithm, and I didn't realize that the algorithm was just sending me everything that I was watching. They were sending me more of the same thing. Then I started hearing about the Panasonic S5, 
and all of a sudden I was getting all these videos from Panasonic Lumix users and I noticed that they resonated with me a lot more than Sony for no reason other than I don't know taste you know like I'll choose John Coltrane over a Metallica taste you know because I'm a jazz player I'm a jazz head you know I don't really I mean I do like some metal I like all kinds of music but I digress I digress which I often do you know make sure your lighting is correct you know make sure that you really learn about shaping lighting and, and don't think of it as a technical aspect of filmmaking but more a creative aspect where it's not just enough to have enough light but to have the proper lighting the lighting the way you want it the way that it's more interesting you know the way that it kind of shapes everything in a way that you look at it in a three-dimensional way and you're like wow you know like experiment and just move the light around a little bit and you'll see it makes a huge difference even when you always have enough light it's really about placing the light and shaping the light and and making it look exactly the way that you feel is a way of communicating the scene that you're trying to communicate the feeling that you're trying to evoke but I finally got a camera because it resonated with me but I got a Panasonic S5 because I know I could grow with this camera like I can't get much better image quality than I get with this camera you know, and actually I keep saying this camera and I'm looking directly at the Panasonic GH5, which is what I'm shooting with right now. But I know that my image quality is good. You know, I got it. I'm happy with it. It's fine. If I get to the point where I feel like my workflow is being interrupted by the fact that I don't have autofocus or, you know, I don't have good enough IBIS or whatever my problem might be, then I would think of switching cameras. But I don't think, you know, like I can't imagine that because I actually enjoy manual focus. Like it doesn't feel like an obstacle to me. I actually like it. I prefer it, you know. Call me crazy, call me wacky or whatever, but that's me, you know. I don't, I don't you know, like, first of all, I don't trust autofocus because even the greatest autofocus is going to make its own decisions at some point. But I don't have to explain that. I enjoy it better, you know. I like it better. Um, I like using vintage lenses. I like really looking at my frame and, you know, I'm like way, way into my composition and looking at every inch of that frame and deciding what aperture would look best for the story that I'm telling and how do I want to portray this scene. And, you know, I'm really into the colors and I'm way, way into lighting and I'm like studying lighting like a mad scientist right now, you know, trying to shape everything. And so, yeah. So, ZV-10 Mark II, awesome. But when I look back on some of the stuff that I said in the video when I originally shot the first part of this video, yeah, it felt kind of arrogant to me. It felt kind of pejorative and judgmental and basically fucked up, you know, and I, I didn't like the way I looked. I didn't like the way I sounded. I didn't like any of that. Panasonic Lumix G87, awesome. So here I am trying to make that better and including it in the same video because we all go through these kind of feelings, right? We all sometimes want to judge other people when we're doing the exact same thing, you know? When we have the same, you know, kind of goal in mind to get as many people's eyes on our work as possible. G9 Mark II, amazing. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get you to all watch my movies, you know? But at the same time, I do want you to watch my YouTube videos, obviously. So why am I like saying, oh, they're doing this because they want you to come to their channel? Of course they want you to come to their channel. s 52 x unbelievable. My Panasonic S5, the original, off the charts. Everything, it gives me life. So, yeah, that was messed up of me, but I'm sure I'll continue to do messed up things and I'm sure I'm gonna continue to be judgmental because you know, the YouTube algorithm and any algorithm fucks with your head and that's the constant challenge to stay supportive because at the end of the day, we should be lifting one another, we should be really encouraging one another. We should be supportive of one another's work no matter what it is, no matter how we approach it, no matter what we do, we should never be talking about other people in a negative way. We should never be criticizing other people unless it's constructive, something that's gonna help somebody else. So I'm just saying, do that and you'll be happy. Sometimes we just get caught up in the wrong things, you know? Like we start thinking about what other people are doing when we should just be Focused on our own projects, you know? Like, just think about what you're doing, you know? Did you write a script? You know, are you making YouTube videos? Are you, you know, in pre-production? Are you studying your lighting? Are you working on your sound production? Like, what are you doing, you know? 
Why are you even paying attention to anybody else? I think about that all the time, you know? I just think like, why are you even thinking about anybody else? And I, you know, usually I don't actually, I'm pretty good at it, but I think that we all do it to a certain extent. And it's not useful, you know? Let me turn this around because the lighting is changing so much. That's the Tappan Zee Bridge behind me, by the way. But you know, we're like thinking about, you know, how many views other people are getting or how many subscribers other people have. And it's like, what does that even have to do with you, you know? I mean, I have to admit, I get caught up in that sometimes when, I, I, when I'm not doing another big project. And see, that's the key. Like, usually I'm working on a movie or a play, something like that. And um, I think that's my point. Like, you know, take YouTube and take all this camera information and take all this spec stuff and take all these settings and apply it to an actual project that you become completely immersed inside of. You know, a story that's important to you that you really care about and you will become obsessed with that project, making it look as good as you can, making it sound as good as you can, making the story as clear and as immersive as possible and something that, you know, people don't even notice your filmmaking. They don't even notice the specs, you know? They just think, wow, I was really moved by that, you know? That's the goal. That's the thing. So I think I notice the only time I get caught up in all this stuff is when I'm in between projects, not working on something. And suddenly I'm like, yo, how come I can't get a thousand subscribers? How come I can't get this? How come I can't get that? But then the minute I start working on a movie or a play or something like that, I ain't thinking about it at all. And for me, that's like, see you in two years. Like I continue to make YouTube videos, but usually what I'm doing is working on my craft. So I'm practicing or I'm in pre-production or you know, trying things out. And it's much better for my mental health. And so, yeah, if I could recommend anything, I would say get involved in some kind of project that's an actual real project outside of YouTube. And um, I think what I'm gonna do with this video right now is I'm gonna put all this together in this video to show you how crazy and schizophrenic we could be in this world with these algorithms and all this stuff that we got to think about. Um, and it kind of takes you away from thinking about the things that matter. So yeah, let's see how that works. You know, you see New York City back there? Can you see it? I'm not sure you could see it. I might be blocking it. Greatest city in the world. See it? I don't live there anymore, but um, it's always going to be in my heart. Can you see it? It's so beautiful. Yeah. Anyway, I hope this video made some kind of sense to somebody somewhere out there in the YouTube land. And I mean everything to be as positive as possible. And um, but sometimes, you know, our brains get kind of messed up. And so, yeah, I'm going to shut up now. And um, that's all that I have on my mind right now. So I'm going to shut up now and stop this video.